Hello everyone, um, <clears throat> welcome to episode 11 of my offline guide. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the pool camps and generally how you should interact with them as the uh, offline. So <clears throat> obviously there are two pool camps on each side. Um, most of the time I'd say that the large camp favours the offlane because it's the easier one to pull into for the offlane and it's quite hard for the off uh, safe lane usually, like this one especially on um, uh, Dyer is quite hard to pull upwards without getting interrupted, it's, the timing is quite difficult, it's pulling it sideways very easy. This one's a little bit easier for Radiant but generally the hard camp is uh, under the offlane's control because they usually control like something like this part of the map, right? Um, usually the small camp is going to help out the um, the uh, safe lane and they're mostly going to be pulling into it to deny XP and fix lane equilibrium. So today I'm going to show you a few examples of when you would want to be blocking these camps or fighting for them or just in general. Um, so in this game we're playing um, I'm playing Tiny in this case, and I have an offlane um, Viper. So, the thing is, we're playing against Morphling, who is a hero that who wants to get XP, he wants to get level 3, and then it's very hard for us to kill him at that point, because he's just going to have a lot of agi shift. You can cheat a lot of health, going low, tank going back up, and trade into Viper successfully. They also have an ogre, or in this case, a I think it's an ogre actually, who's also going to be very strong at hitting the viper, just running at him. Viper, very low movement, low movement uh, speed hero. Um, he's probably going to get punished quite hard if we have to play here, and I'm tiny, so I can't really help him. So I decided I'm going to go pull the creeps. But uh. So the first thing I want to say is, um, if you are planning to pull the creeps, you should probably place this ward, just to see a little bit more um, who's coming to contest you when the creeps are coming exactly. So the important thing is that when you pull the creeps, you want to push out the first wave. So if you play offlane and you tell your support to do this kind of thing, you should always push out with whatever spell you have. A lot of people think that this is not great because in all likelihood the enemy carry is now going to be last hitting four creeps on this tower. But realistically, the enemy carry should probably be last hitting four creeps anyway because it's right here. So unless you guys are playing some super high damage heroes, which we aren't, um, I highly recommend you do something like this. Now, the morph is pretty much preoccupied with um, the uh, fighting the creeps and running at Viper, so I'm going to run over here and t take the creeps. Now, now is the part where I block the small camp. Um, the reason I'm blocking the small camp right now, and I think he blocks the large camp with the sentry, which in my opinion is actually a mistake. But the reason I'm blocking the small camp right now is because after I pull these creeps to here and the equilibrium is pretty much set here, you generally don't want them to have any way of fixing the lane from that point. And if both camps are blocked, there's no way to fix the lane equilibrium. So normally you would tell your offlaner to block this camp either with a sentry or with his body. I think in this case I did tell him, but he, he just, um, I think he was getting fought off by the ogre, which is fine. So sometimes you can bring a sentry and you can block both camps. So if you, from the perspective of the offlaner, if you're playing against the lane, which is hard to deny under their tower, or you want to punish them by making them overextend and die, it's very important you tell your POS4 to steal the wave and to block the small, small camp and you body block the large camp or you sentry block with a sentry or something. Um, so I pull the creeps over. He at this point uses never toxin. Um, it's actually not really a good play because now the equilibrium is going to be reset down here because he... Um, because he basically nuked out wave, we could have set the equilibrium here, but it's fine. Like sometimes these miscommunications happen, right? But if I go back a little bit, you can see that the ogre is now um, the ogre now overextends a little bit. I think he ends up dying here to 
all our nukes and things. But you can see that the Viper is having a little bit of a better time because he's pretty much missed his level 1 weakness, right? They haven't pu really punished him really, really hard. So right now, because the lane still isn't fixed, the next wave will meet exactly here, which I don't want. I'm going to pull again. And since I'm pulling again, I'm also going to block this camp again. Anytime you can block this camp is good. Now, the reason I blocked this large camp right now is because I didn't realize that the ogre had blocked this large camp himself because it doesn't really make sense in my mind that he would block this. Um, so I decided to leave him the small camp to pull instead. Now, the reason I leave him the small camp is because on Radiant, this camp is slightly easier to pull into here than it would be on Dire. It's harder for me to interrupt. He can pull it side, he can pull it down, and it will be really hard for me to interrupt this kind of pull. Um, the large camp obviously denies more creep, gives more XP. It's quite obvious why I'd want to block this over the small camp. The small camp, even if he does a single pull, is still going to fuck with his wave. Now, on Dire, I would recommend blocking the small camp because this large camp pull is so difficult to get off. You have to pull it exactly at 17 or 47. You have to run it all the way up here. It's a very long run. And at, if at any point you get attacked by or the pulse sees you doing any of it, he just runs between you and the creeps and it, the pull is stopped. So, rule of thumb, Dire side, you want to block the hard camp. Radiance, uh, Radiance side, you want to block the small camp. But the prerequisite for blocking camps is that you are in a position where the lane is in a good spot. If the lane is all the way up here, you shouldn't be blocking camps because they can't pull. Because if you, there's no point pulling, right? You're, the carry is just going to get dived on the tower by double waves. Or I mean, there's no reason to pull in that case. There's also no way to pull this if it's all the way down here. And you are the ones who need to be pulling this in order to fix your own lane. So the camps are for the team that need to catch up, essentially. Uh, there are some um, exceptions, but I'll cover that later. Now, you can see this time, I tell him explicitly not to nuke out the wave, so he runs it around. This is a very good thing to do on offlane. It's even better on uh, melee heroes, obviously, because ranged heroes don't have a stout shield, or the equivalent of a stout shield. Right now, you can see that because I didn't block the large camp, this is how I'm going to interact with the small camp. Um, just as a note, in case people are not aware, you pull this camp at 14, uh, you pull this camp at around uh, like 20-ish, I think. And uh, you pull this camp at 14. You pull this camp at 17-ish upwards. You can pull it 20-ish sideways. And um, another thing to note is that on Radiant, if you cut exactly this tree right here, you can pull it like this to up here. And this pull is about 11. So those are all the numbers you need to remember. 11. And uh, plus 30 for, obviously, because every second wave, right? So 11, you can pull here. 14, you can pull here and here. 17, 47, you can pull here. And uh, 20 and 50, you can pull these. So because it's 12 right now, and I left the small camp unblocked, and look at where the lane is right now. Like, this morph is not going to be happy walking up, right? I run over just to make sure the ogre isn't pulling which he isn't. He sees that the large camp is still blocked by himself in this case, okay, but it's fine. Now, right now, there's no reason for me to pull the wave because the lane is stuck here now for the rest of the lane, actually. So let's just see what continues to happen. You can see that um, we don't really have any kill potential right now because I'm, I'm missing a little bit of mana for all my spells. Viper's not really a massive kill potential hero, right? I want to get level 3 um, just to double his uh, damage. Now, once again, right now it's 44, the pull timing, and you can see I'm already running over to fuck with him. Like, let's just see what happens, right? He tries to pull, I aggro the creeps off, he aggroes again, I aggro again, and then the creeps are just stuck in this little tug of war state, right? And then I end up aggroing one last time, and then, bam, no pull. And now look, uh, look at this, right? Let's just check the last hits denies. 16-4 against 10-1. Now, the next wave, because Viper had to tank it a little bit on this tower, ends up meeting a little bit further forwards but even in this case because the lane is just that slightly tiny bit further up and the ogre isn't on the pool he ends up dying on ogre we end up doing quite a lot of damage to this morph if we don't kill him i can't quite remember if we kill him i think we kill him here as well and you can see the lane is like very very favorable because this camp was blocked in this case it wasn't blocked by me which is quite impressive but i've also fucked with this camp a lot now it's obviously harder to do on the offlane, 
um, yourself as like a viper. But you, if you can, if you know these kind of things, and uh, you communicate it properly to your position four, or if you have someone to play with, um, it's going to make your games a lot easier. And in certain cases, you can bring sentry wars to block the camps yourself. Um, but again, it just depends on the condition that you fix the lanes. Now, right now, I think it's minute four, so I went to contest the rune. The Queen of Pain ended up getting the rune, but I think he ended up dying anyway. Yeah, the Queen of Pain ended up dying anyway. And you can see that at this point, the Ogre does a single pull. Um, and, it, like, not a single creep has died um, on their team from this small pool. So the small camp is really not that big of an issue. You see, even right now, I think I go to get the rune. And then I run back just to check the state of the camps. I see that this is blocked. So I now, I, I knew, I think I knew before that it was blocked. But you see that every time the morph is walking up, he's taking a bunch of damage. He's on 13 astits. And it's just the equilibrium and the way that the camps have been um, dealt with. So you see, right now, all I'm doing is stopping this small camp from getting pulled. If you can block it, it's just as good. But, um, you see the morph, this one case, he realizes how important it is that the camp is pulled. So he actually comes to fight me off at the cost of four creeps, right? Because he realizes if he never gets this pull off, he's not going to get a single last hit for the rest of the game, essentially. Now, what ends up happening right now is that because I know that he zoned me off the pool, they're going to get a pool off. Um, what you generally want to do right now is aggress on the carry 2v1 while the support is over here. But in this case, I decided that because it's minute 6 anyway, I'm going to contest the rune and make a little bit of a um, unexpected play, I suppose. I run over here on the rune. It's not here. I toss the willow. I think I run her down. She kills my courier. Right, whatever. But there are going to be cases where um, you do want to be aggressing on their, um, what's it called, their carry. But in this case, I just ended up roaming to mid and staying game two kills. So that was an example of um, a case where blocking camps and stopping pools is, went very successfully and uh, it was a very easy game as a result. Now I'm going to show you an example of a game where we should definitely have done, um, where we should have done it. Um, and what happens if you don't um, respect the uh, the fact, I suppose. Um, so let me see if I can find the game. Um, I think it was this one. So just now, what, I'm, what I discussed was most cases. Now, there are a few exceptions. The first exception is if you play against Elder Titan position 5 and if you play against Enchantress position 5. Elder Titan, Enchantress, Marana, Doom, I'd say, are the four heroes. Let me see if I can remember any more. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Now, against these four heroes in particular, Marana, Doom, Elder Titan and Enchantress, I might be forgetting a few more, but these ones, this guy, he will use his spirits. He will stack camps and he'll use his spirit and he's going to get a fuck ton of damage and he's just going to run at you and it's going to be really, really problematic. Mrana is going to arrow large creeps for free CS. You can't let that happen, even at the cost of losing your own hard camp pool. Um, Enchantress, if she gets a creep, she's going to run at you with it. Doom's going to eat a creep. It might be the harpy and then you're fucked. Uh, the other one is Chen, I suppose. Sometimes you want to be blocking the small camp so he doesn't get a good creep at level one. Now, in this game, I'm playing Pudge offlane with a uh, Snapfire. I think this Snapfire has me muted. At the start of the game, I told him to uh, block the camp because I realized that we're playing against Elder Titan with Boots and one Tango. So, let me just show you what happens uh, in this lane. Right, so... Early game, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, it's not too consequential. You see that the because the snap didn't block the, the camps, here's what happens next. The Elder Titan, he puts down his spirit on me and four creeps and the snap fire. And now he runs at the snap and he chunks him for 110 damage. Right, snap ends up dying. 
um, quite stupidly, I'd say, but, you know, whatever, right? He salves up. Next, he puts the uh, spirit on three hard camps and two heroes and, like, five creeps. And now he's hanging for 120 again, and he runs at Snapfire again, and he ends up dying again. Next, he pulls the camp, right? So this is what happens when this large camp isn't blocked, even if you have the lane in a good place. It just ends up getting fixed, regardless. And now he stacks the uh, small camp. Normally, this is already a very bad situation, because he just stacked two camps, right? And he can now pull a stacked camp. But in this case, it's a hundred times worse, because observe. He puts down the uh, spirit on a million creeps again. In fact, he didn't even put it on as many as he could have. I end up trying to run at him. We don't get the kill. Okay, so he, he now does the uh, stacked pull, right? And now this lane is just a joke. He he is constantly has like 130 damage from all these creeps. He puts the spirit over 20 fucking things. And he's hanging for 180 now, and he kills me. And now this lane is completely over. You can see that by not blocking that first camp and by getting run at, um, this lane is like uh, just unsalvageable. Even if he died that first time, but there was no camps to stack and pull, it would not be as bad because I could have kept the creeps here, could have hooked Spectre on the tower. At least he's not going to be hitting me for 180 at minute four. So in these games, if you don't trust your team, I recommend you just start with a sentry ward and um, block it yourself. Um, there was another game I played recently, which is like quite similar. I think the replay has um, expired, which is unfortunate. Yeah, it's, it's expired. But um, in this game as well, we were playing Viper and uh, Earthshaker against Spectre Ench, which is not a terrible lane really. But if you look at the uh, minute 10, I'm 2,400 net worth and Spectre is 4,300 net worth. And like 99% of the reason was this Enchantress was just taking big creeps and running at me with them. And uh, it's just so important that you don't let that happen. Especially Enchantress, if she enchants a large creep, the lane's just over. Like if you get some Hellbear hits for 110, your lane's just over at minute zero before it even really starts. So whenever you play against those sort of like heroes that really abuse the jungler, uh, the jungle, Make sure that you remember to not let them uh, just win the game for free, essentially. Um, I have another example of um, when you would want to deal with the camps. And this is quite a um, special case, I suppose you can call it. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, it might be a practice game. Uh, I've showed this game before in the past um, a few times because it's the only practice game I've played uh, recently as like a as like a team uh, and those generally genu generally go a little bit better for me because it's uh, more coordinated than things <clears throat> but in this case I'm going to show you the interaction with the camps um, as well so in this game right whenever the enemy is pulling and your team pulls, as the pause 3, you should always run over and fight this 2v1, and then come back and fight this 2v1. So, I'll show you on the next pool. We end up getting some kills. Okay, so, at this point, because I know the timing so well myself, I look at the clock, it's 3.10, Where's Grimstroke? Grimstroke should realistically be here helping a Spectre, but he isn't. And look at where the lane is. I knew at this moment that the Grim has to be doing a single pull, but instead of telling the Lena to fuck with the pool, I told him to run over and kill the Spectre. There's a few reasons why uh, you would make that sort of decision. The first one is uh, Spectre is much weaker at surviving ganks than Morphling. A level 3 Spectre has no defensive tools compared to Morphling, who can always just max, uh, max Morph Strength and uh, get back. So I know that Spectre will likely die, or at least take a huge amount of damage. 
The other reason is because when I was playing Tiny, I was missing mana. In this case, Lina does have mana for Light Strike Ray. And also, Sand King is a little bit better of a setup than Viper. So if you have high kill potential lane and you know their carry will die when their support goes to pool, you should always come over here on the pause 4 and fight them or ask your pause 4 to come. If you guys probably can't get the kill, then it's better to stop the pool. Because if they get the pool off, um, uh, the, the lane's going to be fixed for them temporarily. So as the Grim is pulling, we go on spec. He takes 400 damage. I take the rest of the creeps over here. Now, right now, again, if you look at the clock, 410. Right? Look where the creeps are. I know that the Grim is likely pulling. That's why I'm fighting him even against the creep wave a little bit here because I know my Lina is coming on the flank. And this time he ends up dying. So, just remember, um, a wave of creeps is 200 gold. And a kill is 200 gold, plus their carry doesn't farm. So sometimes it's better to let them just deny wave of creeps and let your pause 4 fuck with the uh, pause 5. But sometimes it's better just to just straight up kill them, if th because that will accelerate your game more. Killing them is like a high risk move. Stopping the pool and fixing everything over here is like the low risk um, play. Now, one final case I wanted to show um, is this Brewmaster game. Um... So in this game, uh, I think it's this game at least. I might. Uh, it's just one final example of uh, how you should interact with the camps. Um, let me just skip forwards a little bit. So in this game, I'm playing Brew against uh, Morph and. Um, Warlock, I think it was. So, again, we look at the lanes. Warlock Morph is a very defensive lane. They basically just want to heal and abuse this uh, Morph shit. And the more when he gets level 3, it's really hard for me to harass him. He's just going to be outlast hitting me, blah, 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 right? But early game, we have a little bit of an advantage. So, I think uh, nothing really interesting happens for the first part of this game. Pretty much just random fighting. But... You can see that we um, we ended up blocking the enemy small camp, and they ended up blocking our uh, large camp. Um, obviously, for the safe lane over here, they understand that if we can pull, they can't really contest it. Warlock, um, very weak uh, fighter, right? Can't really trade into Rubik too well. And Morphling, very, very low movement hero. Whenever the enemy carries a low move speed hero, the offlane are going to be winning the camps because the uh, the carry can't run from his tower to help his support fast enough to contest the pool. So understanding this, they block the large camp. Um, generally, if you can, you want to be blocking this small camp because you're not using it for anything. But in this game, because both camps are blocked, um, we end up not being able to do a lot of um, pressure on the morph. Like, if you look at the morph, he's pretty much just going to be constantly farming under his tower. The only reason that this ends up going quite badly for them is because someone messed up the equilibrium earlier. I think the warlock made some random attacks. But if they hadn't made these mistakes, it, the game would just be in like a stalemate right now. Um, so let's have a look at the last it's denies. I'm 19 against 17. But this could be a lot worse. I could be like 15 against 25 or something realistically. And Morph has got his levels. And it's because this camp is blocked. So if you guys are playing against a very defensive lane. With strong um, laners. You should always ask your pause 4 to start with a sentry ward. And fight for this camp. And obviously if you're playing one of those heroes that I mentioned earlier. Marana, Doom for example. You should always either start with a sentry yourself. If you don't trust your pause 4. Or ask him to start with a... Um, ward. If you get, uh, if you start with a uh, large group on Enchantress offlane, you win the game. I know a lot of people, they actually start a sentry on themselves and they ask their pause 4 to buy a sentry. That's how important it is. There are some other, like, um, niche heroes who want the camp unblocked. Um, but not necessarily, I suppose. Um, a lot of the time, when I play Sand King, um, let me just show this game really quickly, actually. Um, a lot of the time when I play Sand King or um, or uh, Axe, 
um, I'm trying to think of other examples like bristleback maybe you're going to be pulling the wave and you're going to be cutting into the jungle a lot so let me show you in this game uh let me skip to minute seven right so i'm playing sand king i have a roaming pause for tiny um i get a few points in my uh w two points and i'm just playing over here and i'm trying to sandstorm i tp out one time i run back over I sandstorm two waves, I grab the wave, and I'm farming the jungle and the wave right now. And now I run over here. Mm. Farm the jungle and the wave, and I TP up here. But a lot of people, what they do is, after they lose the safe lane, um, or they're not doing very well in it, they uh, they will block this camp themselves, or this camp, to stop the enemy offlaner from pulling into it and farming everything. Um, one common thing you can do if you lose the offlane yourself, like very badly, um, is you should buy a sentry yourself and just block this large camp because when the enemy carry is winning, you'll push in the wave and he'll come back and he'll farm this. And if you can stop him from farming this and just make him run to the small camp, it's going to hurt his GPM a lot. He'll lose like 90 gold per wave until someone comes to deward it or deal with the problem, which usually takes a while. They'll probably miss one or two camps, right? Um, and you're already behind. If you trade 90 gold for the enemy carries 200 gold or something, that's like a very, very big up uh, trade up. Um, so I think that's pretty much everything to do with the jungle covered. Um, just as a sneak peek, I guess, I think uh, tomorrow, let's say, uh, I'm going to be talking about warding, which seems like a support thing. But... Um, I feel like it sometimes it's important to understand what the other roles are going to be doing when you play position three, because again, like a lot of the time you're going to be doing everyone's job for them. So obviously in today's video, I talked a lot about what the position four should be doing, but it's important that you understand um, their responsibilities, etc. So you can play around it and you can tell them what to do if they seem a little bit off. So for example, if it's 10 seconds in, you should play a little bit less aggressive since your pause four might be going to try to stop the pool, for example, right? So just try and always, if any time you learn about a different role, try to see that in the aspect of like, oh, I can, position four obviously helps you play position three. Um, position five is your opponent on the lane. So any information you learn about that, you can use it against them. Same with position one, position two, who cares? Fuck mid lanes. Uh, I think that's all.